All right. Um, I posted the next assignment, and the next assignment we will be doing probably incrementally throughout the rest of the semester. That's my plan, anyhow. And we'll take a look at it, and I think it'll be fun. And it, it'll be fun because, if, if nothing else, it'll allow us to play cards for some of our class sessions so that we learn the game. All right? So um, that, that'll be good. And, and I may talk about the assignment later on today, or I may talk about it next time. Um, today I want to fin finish up the canon example. There were three things that were most relevant to that example. And the one was, let me see if I can remember them. The one was the threading aspect of it. Now, we did threading in a little bit different way, but the, the basic idea is the same. You create another thread because you don't want something blocking the UI and having an unresponsive application. So in the case of the database examples, you do it because a database operation, relatively speaking, takes long compared to other sorts of operations. So you want to make sure that the UI is responsive. The second uh, example that we did, the, the Canon game example, the idea was that we did not want the drawing of the shapes on the screen to interfere with the user's interaction with the screen of clicking on the cannon to aiming the cannon or to shoot the cannon and so on. So we had them in different threads for that reason. So they would both get attention and so it wouldn't be like you'd move it and while you moved it the pieces would stop even for like just even the shortest hesitation. They move smoothly because they're in separate threads, both threads are running and, and therefore they both get attention. So the two other things uh, that I want to talk about, we probably will talk about that today. I'll probably get to both of them today. If not, we'll finish up on Thursday. Uh, and again, depending on time, we might talk about our last assignment. Um, relates to capturing gestures and drawing on the screen. All right. So far, we've done images on the screen, but we haven't really drawn drawn on the screen. And let me bring up the application so I can show you what I mean. With the Canon game, notice how we don't have an image. We simply have our canvas and we have these things sliding along the canvas and they're moving. So we're actually physically drawing those things and redrawing them over and over again. All right. The other thing is we don't have buttons that we click on. We can click anywhere on the screen. So we can click to aim it. A double click will shoot it. A swipe gesture shoots it without aiming it, I believe. We'll have to look at the code. Maybe not. So, two things we want to look at today. We're going to look at the gestures and we're going to look at the drawing. We'll look at the gestures first, all right? And we can almost, yeah. Sure. Um, I like to. I like to when you do these apps in Android. Right. Um, when you speak of gestures and things in iOS, is it a completely different environment where you're going to have to look at things? Like a, I know it's a different language, but is the fundamentals different as far as uh, you know, like as far as imaging? Is is that something that's? <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's built on top of a different framework. So I mean. It, it, just the basic fact that for most applications, there's an Android and a iOS way of doing it. Um, to a lot of degree, the, the details of how they're implemented are going to be different, and what they call certain things are going to be different. So it is sort of a different beast. So how does one like myself who has an app that I want to make, because I have someone who wants to have this app, right? How do I? Where do I go? Do I have to hire an iOS developer, or do I have to learn iOS myself, or is there anything out there that can... Well, 
you, you have options, of course. With everything, you have options. Uh, it's funny. I, I've told my class before that whenever I ask a question of them, just yell out maintainability and you're right. The, the flip side of that is when you ask me a question, I can always answer it depends, and, and it'll be right. So to answer your question, it depends. All right, it depends on what? It depends on what you want to do. One, you could certainly learn and write the app in both platforms. Two, you could, simp you could hire out one of the apps. In fact, ideally, if you got, say, the Android version of the app working, what better specification could you have than here is the Android app, go and do it, you know, and hand it to someone and they could do it. So hire out, that would be another option. A third option is through the use of what is called a phone gap, all right? Phone gap, and there's, there's sort of the cousin of phone gap called phone gap build, allows you to take HTML5 code and generate native apps for iOS, Android, even Windows, I think, and BlackBerry, all right? We actually do that. We don't do that in this class. Um, we, have, we do that in the web, uh, the mobile web class, where you take an HTML5 page and you can go and you can generate an app for iOS, Android, and you can download it. There are other languages that work similar to that. So there are frameworks where you develop in a common set of code and then it generates both applications. The problem with that is that adds an extra layer in there, you know. And so I would question, um, despite the claims of the people that make it, um, whether it would it would be you know if you use one of those tools if it would if it would work completely correctly and, and produce the exact same um, applications with no problems in both platforms. But those are your choices to enumerate. Yes, learn iOS yourself, hire part of it out, or use a tool, PhoneGap being one of them, and there are other ones. Let me do a quick Google to, um, to uh, look at. Well, there's one called Xamarin. Okay. That's huge. I mean, they claim you that. But you need to have a Mac. You have to design it on a Mac. Right. Because if you do it on Windows, you can only do Android. So you, you can do Android right. and iOS on the Mac. But the question I have is, where, as a developer, is learning Android? There's, isn't there going to be a time that's coming up where people are going to say, look, isn't there one person who's going to do both? Isn't there going to be technology that's going to be able to take both and, and develop an app that can go on these phones? Or do you see in the future that, hey, there's that side and there's the Android side, and that's the way it's going to be? Well, th that, that, those are really good questions. Um, I, I do not see, um, I definitely see that, I, I don't see moving away from the, the two platforms, the two major platforms, all right? Um, and again, things will be muddied further when you get into things like, you know, wearable devices and, and things like that, the, the, the watch and, and all that. So that's going to continue to be a problem. Because um, like some guy, somebody I know mentioned that he, he is using this iOS app. Right. And he hates it the way he says, I've got to go through too many, he's a musician, and mm -hmm. what they do is they have uh, fake books, and, and they, right. they're on stage, and they have a tablet up. Right. And they say, I, want, I need to know this song, so I hit it, and it shows a chart. Right. It's a simple thing, but they made it really difficult, and they're selling it for like 17 bucks. What he wanted to do is, could you make something simple? I said, it sounds like you're pulling PDFs, right. displaying it. I said, yes, I could do that, but how? I'm trying to figure out how, if I do an Android, how do I get iOS? Right. What, where do I go? Because the, all these guys are using like um, Apple products. Right, right, so. right. Um, well, again, um, there will probably continue to be better and better tools to allow development in one place that can port to both of them. I just, I, I philosophically, um, having seen these sorts of tools for all sorts of things, know that they never work out perfectly. Because again, you're adding an extra layer. So when you add an extra layer, that's an extra potential trouble point. Doesn't mean you can't work around it or whatever, but that is an extra potential trouble point. So, 
My guess is they'll continue to develop tools. Um, depending on the depending on the app itself and how complex the app is, if you're working as part of a team, yeah, you might have your Android team and your iOS team. Um, otherwise, yeah, I mean, in, in IT, you know, it's always valuable if you can the, the more that you can do. And the nice thing is, is again, you know, once you sort of get used to the, the mobile mentality, even if the details of the syntax are different, that gives you sort of uh, um, a, a leg up. Part of the success of developing a good mobile app is just like developing any app, you know, understanding the user's needs, thinking of the best way to do it and all that. And some of that kind of, some of those skills will kind of translate, you know, because they're not really specific to the technology. So I, I wish I had a better answer. But I mean, that's like the only answer I have. Well, I understand. I just—it's just reminds me of the browser wars back in the day, where Netscape. Yep. And there was to, somebody would say it worked better on, on right. Internet Explorer. Then eventually, time I find that standards. And obviously right. Obviously, this is a lot more difficult. Cause yeah. You know, well, well, again, this is a lot more difficult because this is something that's tied to a specific piece of hardware. You know, a browser theoretically is simply an app that runs and as long as it follows a certain protocol it ought to work. So it's built around the notion of standards and interoperability and, and things like, of, like of that. Whereas with an app, an app is designed to work in a certain environment uh, with a certain piece of hardware, with a certain way to access the camera, with a certain way to access the contacts and so on. So. That's going to be hard to see standardization in that, in my mind. All right, great question. Let's look at the gesture handling in this. And if we look at it, we'll look at the Canon game. I always like to remove the stuff that I'm not looking at immediately. So I don't get confused. If we remember, the Canon game is what we defined as sort of the UI thread. And the Canon view is a view that runs in its own thread. If we look at this, or rather a thread gets started within that view. So let's look at the Canon game, and let me copy that over into text edit so we can take a closer look at it. All right, we're importing a couple of packages, a gesture detector and a simple on gesture um, class. This is what handles the, the interactions on, on the screen. Now. It's very similar to it's very similar to the other kinds of listeners. We create a gesture listener for this associated with this view and we store that in general detector. Oh, my, mis my mistake. I'm, I'm off base. Give me a second here. Let's look at let's look at this method and find the signature of the method instead of me relying on my fuzzy memory.
some of these constructors are deprecated. Yeah, in other words, the DDL examples were done on an earlier version of Android for this. Because um, this is creating a gesture detector, a new gesture detector. This is passing this um, context and it's creating a gesture listener. And there we go. And it's creating, uh, it's creating that, gesture listener, which is a simple gesture listener. All right, I got it. And it's doing it for this context. Again, that, that is deprecated. But what we have here is we have an on-touch motion event. All right? And here's where I tweak the code a little bit. I commented out this stuff. Because originally, it didn't handle the swipe method. And I put the swipe method in. The swipe is where you drag your finger across it. Across it. So what I did is I'm letting the gesture detector handle all those events. And my gesture uh, detector has an on down method, an on fling method, and an on double tap method. So this, okay, this is what I did. Originally, originally I think that if you tapped it, it aimed it and shot it, and if you did a long or a double tap, it fired it without aiming, I think. You have to look at it. If, if you want to, you can download the original code to see what it used to do. But I changed it to do this. All right, so let's, we have this on touch event that gets called on the view, and we let the gesture detector handle that event. So we pass to our gesture detector this gesture listener, all right? And we handle these two or three different things. So on tap, on down, when I first touch it, it simply aligns the cannon. So as I touch it, it aims the cannon. If I double tap, tap it, it shoots it. And if I fling, it aims it and shoots it. All right. Notice that these listeners don't do much on their own. They call the methods that exist on the Canon view. So we've created our gesture detector which is a gesture detector. This is the name of the class that we're using, and this relates to it's for this particular object. On any touch event that we get, I've commented out the code that Deedle had, and I'm calling the gesture detector on touch event. And the gesture detector's on touch events then looks and determines the kind of event it is whether it is on down, on fling, or on double tap, and does the appropriate thing depending on what was done. All right. These are all methods that exist in the Canon view. So it's pretty straightforward to handle the different gestures. All right. Now the details of what you do when you do those things, that's where the devil comes in the code that actually goes and aims a cannon or, or shoots a cannon or whatever. That's difficult. But actually writing code to handle the gesture, that's how you do it. You define a, gen, uh, uh, a, uh, a gesture detector. You then can invoke it to handle the different um, events that get called. All right. Next thing I want to look at is drawing on the screen. Let's 
just look at where it's drawing something on the screen and try to make sense of it. Here we're setting all the properties and then we call new game and update positions. This is the point that this is the method that actually draws the stuff. Those other methods do the calculation. So for example, when I aim the cannon, it tells me the degrees that it should be rotated. All right? I do calculations to determine what to move going across the screen. The drawing, though, is actually doing the drawing. And we're drawing on a canvas. Okay. We're drawing on a canvas. And a canvas is, again, typically what the kind of thing that we draw on. All right, and it sort of makes sense even by the name. Let me do a search for where this gets called. It gets called as part of that thread. All right. And the canvas is grabbing a pointer to the surface of the app. What we do then is we draw different things on it. We can say to draw a rectangle, zero, zero. Canvas get width, canvas get height, background paint. That is effectively drawing the big white rectangle that covers the whole screen. All right? That whole rectangle gets drawn by this line of code. Zero, zero indicates the starting position of the rectangle. The zero height, zero width. The bottom point of the rectangle is the width of the canvas and the height of the canvas, so that goes down. And then background paint is the color that we're using to draw it. And if we look somewhere here, background paint gets defined as being white in one of these initialization things. Background paint gets set as white. So. We draw the background. The next thing draws things like how much time is left and that sort of thing. So when we're running this, we actually draw the text on the canvas and that represents that line on the top here, time remaining X seconds. If the cannonball is on the screen, so when we click the button to shoot it, the cannonballs on the screen, we draw it based on the position. And we do that with a draw circle command, which accepts, again, the coordinates of the cannonball, the X and Y coordinate, the radius, how big the cannonball is going to be, and then finally, cannonball paint, that's the color of the cannonball. So cannonball radius is set when we initialize the game.
somewhere. There we go. Cannonball radius. We actually make it relative to the width of the screen. So on a bigger device, you get a bigger cannonball. Somewhere here, we initialize cannonball paint to be, or cannon paint to be the color that we want. This paint object, notice, is more than just the color. We can actually set other attributes of this as well. We can set how thick the line is that we use to draw, and so on. Now the other positions, the X and Y positions, get called or get set when we do the calculate uh, the position on this update position method. So in other words, it looks at the cannonball, figures out the new X and Y based on if the cannonball is on screen or not and what the cannonball's velocity is, and then it uses that when it gets to redraw the cannonball down here. We draw a line for the cannonball barrel. That's the little thing that sticks out. So this is a, the circle is a, uh, is part of the ca cannon, and the little barrel that sticks out is the cannonball barrel. Now, if you notice that the barrel and X and barrel and Y, that gets calculated, and that gets calculated based on some math concerning where we've tapped and the angle that we um, need to set the, the cannon uh, barrel to. We then draw the line that goes back and forth because that's moving as well. That's the blocker, the line that goes across. And then we draw the target. And the target we draw um, depending on whether it's been hit or not. Because if we hit it with the target, we don't draw it. If we do, we do. It alternates between saying the target to blue or yellow. All right. And if it hasn't been hit, it will draw it. Otherwise, it will skip it. So the idea is, is we're drawing right on a canvas, all right? And when we do our next homework assignment, which is a game, we're probably going to want to draw the cards, okay? Now, we'll talk about that in a few minutes here, but it's unlike the blackjack game where we use a deck of cards. You could actually draw the cards that we're doing here. And we'll do that in a slightly different way because we're not drawing on the canvas, we're going to be drawing on an image view. So we need to associate a canvas with the image view and then go and do our thing. All right. Let me talk about the next homework assignment, which is going to go for a, a series of uh, weeks, probably the remainder of the semester. It's to play a game called Set. How many of you have played set? All right, good. We're all at the same disadvantage then. Well, not me, because I did it last semester. But I was a rookie. And it's one of those games that looks tough until you, like, think about it for a while, then it's, it's actually pretty easy. Um, but it gets a little tricky. All right? We're going to play it by ear and see how far we can get with this application. We won't necessarily write a complete application, but we could write little pieces of it. We could write a little tutorial if you will, for it, or a little uh, testing tool to make sure that you understand the rules. I posted a link to Angel on how the game works. Like any successful game, there's like knockoffs on it, right? For every Tetris, there's like a something else is, all right, that is something other than Tetris. Well, this is no example, and there's an online version of the game that I think is called Dow. And we can look at that. Whoops. Here's a variation of the game. 
I actually have a physical deck of cards that we'll bring in. And we could maybe spend the last 15 minutes of class today familiarizing ourselves with it. Um, or, uh, or maybe we can do it again next time. I encourage you to work on groups, uh, work in groups for this assignment. And I'll talk about specifically what the first part of the assignment consists of after I've explained a little bit the rules. The rules are like this. Every card there are three attributes, I'm sorry, four attributes to the card, all right? One of the attributes is the shape. That's a triangle, rectangle, circle. I think that's the only three values. So triangle, circle, and rectangle. That's in this in this version of it. That's all we have. We can look when we when we bring the actual cards in. We can go look in and see that. So one attribute is the shape. One attribute is the number of shapes on the card. All right. One attribute is the color of the card, and one attribute is the filling of the card. Now this might be a little hard to see, but this one is hollow. This one is solid. This one is dotted. All right. Might not be able to see it. That's why I'll get the actual physical cards and we'll take a look at it. Now, something will make a set if for each of the four properties considered independently, they are either all match or are all different. Okay. This, for example, is a set. Why? Because they're shapes, all different. Triangle, rectangle, oval. So their shapes are all different. The number are all the same. Three, three, and three. The filling is all the same. Hollow, hollow, hollow. And the color is all different. We have red, green, so that is a valid set. And if you're playing set and you saw that, you'd pick up those cards and you get points for the number of cards that you get and, and so on. All right? This online thing allows us to go and play this. So for example, do you see any sets up here? Let me, let me take a second to see. I see a set. This card, this card, and this card make a set. All right? Now it disappeared, unfortunately. But This would also be a set, one, two, and three, because the numbers are all different, the colors are all the same, the shapes are all the same, and the filling is all the same. So this would be a set, and it tells us this. If we click something wrong, for example, this, this, and this, notice it didn't increment the number of sets, because that's not a set. But on the other hand, see if I can find any more. No. I was going to say this one, this one, and this one, but two have the one filling and one has a different filling. So they're not all the same. That might be all the sets that we have, although this can get tricky. Okay, I 
ask us to help. Okay. So at any rate, that's how the game comes. When I'm going to finish up here in a minute, I'll go get the cards and we'll sit and we'll play the cards for a while. That'll be a be better way and it'll be more obvious because if you see the actual physical cards. Now, I don't, I don't want you for this to write a complete set game, at least not yet. What's due next week is simply a design. All right? And you're welcome to work on it together. All right? So you can take some time and work on it together to figure it out. What I want you to do is I want you to randomly generate three cards, then ask the user, is this a set or not? Yes or no? And keep track of how many right they get, how many wrong they get. All right? That's all you have to do. For the first, well, the first pass is just a design. So you could, you know, you, def you define the objects or the classes that you're going to have and the methods that you're going to have and what the interface is going to look like and so on. All right? After that, we'll go from there. The idea will be, though, that we're going to build on this. So don't build something so specific that it can't be enhanced for this. But the first pass, you will generate three cards, ask the user if it's a set, and then tell them if they're right or wrong. Okay? I'm going to finish up the lecture here, then we're going to go get the cards, and we'll take a look at it.